Thank you for listening to The Lawyer's Daughter. This is Jen Carroll. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. Today is September 14th and we are on day 53. And today I'm going to talk about federal agencies because I think we don't know them. I mean, we know them, they come up in conversation, they pass through our lives, we hear about them, DOD, uh, FEMA, different things, we hear about them. But I have a hypothesis that most of us don't actually know what they all do or the extent to what they do. And the fact that Project 2025 wants to rip through these agencies and remove budget, remove staff, and essentially um, privatize as much of what these agencies do as possible. And here's the deal. The government is not supposed to uh, work like a business. I talk about this a lot. I come from the business world. I've worked in business my whole life, tons of business because I've been a consultant. So I've actually worked probably for more companies than most because of the nature of my work. But business has a very specific set of requirements. And number one is to be profitable. That's absolutely the goal of business. It is not the goal of government to be profitable. It is not measured on the same criteria. It is not held to the same standards and it is not, it doesn't have a deliverable that is the same as a business. A government is there to support its people and to help us thrive. That's t typically what a government is for. Unfortunately, bad people make their governments do bad things. They turn into authoritarians. They, they've turned into, um, they like the control, the power, but that's not where we are. We're in America. This is a good thing. We are in a democracy. This is a good thing. And these agencies, the government runs are here to help us. So let me just remind you of who they are. And this is all the today's content is really setting up tomorrow's content where I'm going to tell you things that these agencies do to make your life better that you may not even appreciate or know about. And that's really the secret here. So it's one thing for Project 2025 to trot out with their multi-hundred page, 800 and something page book. This, this thing, it's like as big as my, sorry, it's like as big as my murder book. I carry around my murder book. It's this huge, huge book of all the articles and things that happened during the murder. It's like the only, since it happened in the 80s, it's newspaper clippings are kind of all I have. I can't even go back and get newspaper clippings from when the murder happened. So yeah, I have my big murder book. Well, that's about as big as Project 2025's book. It's huge. So what we want to do today, or my goal today was to remind you of what these agencies do. And then tomorrow I'll talk about what they're doing for you actively and what you what we're going to put at risk if we elect the GOP and if we elect Trump. And remember, Trump's the figurehead. Everything else that happens is really about getting the Project 2025 in place. It's not... Trump really doesn't give a crap. This is the whole thing. This is why it's so easy for him to change his positions and say, oh, on abortion, uh, six weeks. We need six weeks. Well, he's a person who's actually used the abortion uh, regulation. I mean, he he benefited from Roe v. Wade. Let's, let's just stop there. But the thing is, is that turning off all of these services and changing the way our agencies work and putting them all under the thumb of an executive who's at the top is not going to help us. So let's go through it. It's going to be a little bit tedious. I'm trying not to make it tedious, but it'll be a little bit tedious because I'm going to tell you about 15 agencies. It's kind of the essence of um, boringness, right? Hopefully though, hopefully as you hear about them, you'll figure out that, oh my gosh, that's how we get to get this thing done. That's how things are changing. And what I did is I pulled some of the top initiatives being worked on right now during the Biden administration. I actually went and looked at some during the Trump administration, things that had happened, but they're so, I don't want to go back there. It, it would make this podcast way too long and I don't want to take forever, but um, I can, maybe what I'll do is just append a list of what just a sampling of what the agencies were doing in the Trump administration. I might append that list to the blog. I just have to have the energy. I'm a little bit tired today. All right. So anyway, let's talk about these agencies. Uh, they're really, these agencies play a unique and crucial role in our day-to-day -day functioning and they're bureaucratic structures, but they're entities with specific missions. So you could maybe think that could it run more efficiently? I suspect always I've worked for companies that run efficiently and they could still run more efficiently. efficiently. So I think efficiency is always something we want to look for because it's, it's spending our tax dollars, right? So you need to be uh, cognizant of the responsibility you have in spending tax dollars and doing that in a way that's reasonable and productive for the citizenry. So that's, that's always in play, but, but saying that you don't like it because it's wasting you, that's a, that is a, sorry. 
that's a sim oversimplification of what's going on. And that's the part that gets me upset because if you oversimplify what these agencies do and say, oh, we just need to cut, and we just need to cut and replace everybody, which is what essentially the GOP is saying, uh, that is very detrimental to our democracy. That is not the kind of thing that you want to ever have to see happen. Okay, so the missions of these agencies range from national defense to public health to environmental protection, and the leaders are responsible for implementing federal laws and maintaining public programs. And what's really interesting is it's the way it's structured in terms of these agencies and what they're working on feels a lot to me like me sitting in what I call e-staff, executive staff, right? And executive staff, we all come, we all represent, like I owned marketing, we all represent our areas of expertise. And you sit at the table at e-staff and you say what your area is doing. And then you look for ways that your area, like for me, marketing, where can I do better with sales? Where could I do more, better with QA and product development? Where could I do better with customer service? That I have a role in all of those uh, in all of those functions as a marketing person. So that's what you do at ESTAP. It's interesting, but that's essentially how the agencies are set up. All these secretaries and directors come to the table, these cabinet secretaries that report to the president, come to the table and report on their areas of expertise. So I'm going to I'm gonna dive in because, like I said, it's it's a list, which is not my favorite kind of content, but I wanted to I want to bring it to life. And you need to understand that these agencies are really deeply tied to the health of our democracy. Without them, we, we, st we will start to see infrastructure crumbling that will set us back, not just right now, but it'll set us back in many areas for years. I mean, we've got some big problems here. And I know that, that the GOP and the Heritage Foundation and Federal Society have been running a long game. You know, I'm the first one to talk about it. But at this point, I, I can't even believe we're going to let them get near putting these institutions and, and these agencies in any kind of jeopardy because we're not going to be able to build it back. Once it's broken, like remember when Trump fired all the scientists from DC and they went, a bunch of them moved, I think, I don't have the story right. Uh, Rachel reported on it. Rachel Maddo was reporting on this. This happened during the Trump administration. He just cut all the scientists. Well, we don't have that back. That's the problem. You can't just turn it off. This isn't like tech. You can't just turn off a dial and come back and turn it on later. These are people with jobs, with, with projects that are in the works that are like longitudinal studies that need time. So turning these things off and then thinking we can just turn them back on, that's not how it works. We will lose institutional knowledge. That's an important, important, important asset, one that companies forget all the time. I cannot tell you how many mergers and acquisitions I have been part of, and companies freaking throw away their institutional knowledge. Like, I cannot believe it is one of the most costly, dumb, oh, I have so many bad words I want to say, one of the stupidest things the people at the top do, because they don't have visibility to how things work, and they throw away institutional knowledge. And it costs them a lot. And they never seem to account for that cost. In fact, I, I'm recently just terminated from a company that's doing exactly that. They're throwing away institutional knowledge. What a dumb, dumb thing to do. But um, people that are managing spreadsheets don't seem to care about that. And, and that's what Project 25 has done here is said, we cannot let citizens run their own country anymore. We need to put nefarious people in charge and we need to do it for them because the citizenry is not to be trusted. That's really the underlying concept underneath all of the Project 2025 philosophy, which is humans, us, we, the people can't be trusted. We cannot have the power. Only the people in the particular, the white nationalist men, only those Christian white nationalist men can have the power. In fact, they'll tell you straight up, women don't get the power. They have the power and you get to be part of the power of their power. We're subjugated to their power, which whatever, we just already talked about who you belong to if you are a single woman right now. Who do you belong to if you are a single woman? That's the question you have to find out because it's it's not your ex-husband. It's probably your father or your brothers. There you go. All right, Jenny, put it back under the table. Get off the thing. Okay, let's dig into these agencies. Y'all already know my soapbox issues. I'm just trying to strive for an America where we all can make our decisions for about our own lives in a nice, happy, healthy way. And people could just leave each other the hell alone. Oh my God, could we just get there? All right. The first one I'm going to give you is the most expensive agency we have out there, and it's called the Department of Defense. And this doesn't surprise you, I'm sure, Secretary Lloyd Austin. Their mission is providing military force to protect our security. So that includes the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, and 
There's a fifth now, Space Force. I wish we didn't have to have the ridiculous name that Trump gave it, Space Force, because it, in its very name, it looks stupid. Sorry, no offense to anybody on the Space Force, but I don't want, I don't want a Space Force. That sounds lame. I just don't want Space Force. Just want NASA back. Just want NASA. Okay, anyway, keep going. So they get $842 billion annually. And here's what they're working on as part of the Biden administration. An integrated deterrence strategy. So this is an integrated deterrence strategy, meaning to keep us out of wars by putting together plans around diplomacy, economic tools, and alliances so that we are part of a unified front that deters adversaries from aggressive actions. Sorry. Deters adversaries from aggressive actions across land, sea, air, space. And they include cyberspace, which is really interesting. Probably just say cyber, but there's not cyberspace is kind of old fashioned. They have a climate ad adaptation plan. This is the DOD guys. They're trying to ad adapt to the security risks posed by climate change. So if you imagine and you're running a war and you have climate change on top of it, it'll be interesting to watch what happens in Ukraine this winter. Are the winters going to be worse or less? It's hard to know, but that's what they, the, the DOD has to plan for climate change as part of their adaptation. And then of course, go ahead, I'm going to light you up on this one. DOD is working on diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's DEI. And you know what? Good for them. Because the fact is, a good military comes from a diverse military and a good military has women and has people of color and has gay people and has trans people and has everybody else because their job isn't about who they are as humans. Their job's about who they are as soldiers. So we need to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion so we can stop sex crimes in the military. How's about that? That's a good thing to do. Okay. So those are the kind of things happening in the Department of Defense, aside from the obvious thing that we all know. Okay. The Department of Homeland Security is Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, and that department is responsible for terrorism, border security and immigration, and responding to national disasters, or I'm sorry, natural disasters. So isn't that weird? Homeland Security includes natural disasters, but it does up to a point, and then we'll find out it has some other features as well. But FEMA is part of the agencies that report in through the Department of Homeland Security. They've rolled FEMA up into there. Uh, the budget for the Department of Homeland Security is 103 billion. And these numbers are gonna mean a lot to you other than I kind of keep in my head the defense spend, which was 848, right? 800, oh, 842 billion. So essentially, if you can keep that number in your mind, 842 billion for defense, you can start to assess how we're spending for the other things relative to the 848, right? So the Department of Homeland Security is getting 103 billion. In my humble opinion, I would, and, and I know Kamala's talked about this, I think we should move at least 100 billion out of defense. And I, I, I'm talking out of my butt because I don't know what those things pay for. Like I, I've, I've never gone into the um, line items in the budget. I'm sure it would make my head explode. But the, but my instincts tell me we should be spending a hundred billion more in cyber and not up on just uh, military, like, you know, machines, uh, ma machines of war. I think we've got to really look at cyber. So I, I would personally, and I know Kamala's talked about restructuring some of where she's spending so, and cyber is a big one for her, which thank God somebody, this is what happens when you get somebody younger, they actually understand the newer threats. I don't think Trump has a clue. He doesn't even use email, guys. He's so out of touch with technology. He has no idea. So the idea that Kamala already understands this, she already understands it. She's already looking at how to fund this better is good for us. We really do need to focus on cybersecurity. I actually think that's probably one of our biggest vulnerabilities right now, because you know what? You don't have to worry about mobilization. Remember how we just talked about climate control? Climate's not a factor for cybersecurity other than on or off. That's it. It's not going to be impacted in other ways. So cyber is a very big threat vector for us. So what are they working on at Homeland Security right now? They're working on cybersecurity and infrastructure. They're trying to make sure that that's the CISA, CISA that I love. Uh, that's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I talk about that. That's been part of the work I've done in my career. And then we have border security and immigration reform, which were if we would just have passed the bill, we wouldn't be in chaos right now. But that's what Trump wanted. He likes chaos because 
know why I don't know why people like to live like this, but he likes to live like this. I get some attention. He's a narcissist. What do you know? And then we have something very interesting happening in the Department of Homeland Security, and that's countering domestic violent extremism. And that's domestic terrorism, folks. And I hate to say it, but we had incidents of that last night in Springfield, Ohio, where acid was put on cars and people have been threatened. And today, hospitals, two hospitals in Springfield are closed. I've, I've got to guess that's all they have is two hospitals in Springfield. Santa Cruz, we only have one hospital. So I, I know it's not that much of a bigger town. So the two hospitals were closed for bomb threats. This is terrorism in the United States against our own citizens. And if you think the Haitians are there illegally, you need to disabuse yourself of that absolutely fake, fake, fake news. These are Haitians. I called them refugees because I understood, and it, apparently it is true, that they, they left under political persecution and they were absolutely allowed to immigrate here legally. So they are legal immigrants. So this countering domestic violence, violence is a really interesting new role for the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you, Trump. And Trump and all you idiots who continue to, to propagate and perpetuate the nonsense, the lies, the vitriol, the racism, the insanity. Next, we have the Department of Health and Human Services. That's Secretary Xavier Becerra. And that is everything you think it should be to ensure public health and human services through agencies like the Center for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institutes of Health. And they report to the executive branch and they get $1.7 trillion in mandatory funding. And that would be for, I'm sure, the programs. And one one four four $144 billion, $144 billion for discretionary, which I'm going to guess is uh, research, because that's usually how you approach research. It's with discretionary spending. You fund the project and that's it. It has a beginning and an end. So typically that's what lends under discretionary. They're working on expanding access to health care. So that has to do with strengthening the Affordable Care Act and expanding Medicaid coverage to underserved populations. Y'all know that there are some governors who turned down this this um, the ACA. So we want to get everybody on it. There, of course, it's the poor states because the poor states suffer from leaders who give no crap about them. Uh, they're also addressing health and human services is addressing the COVID pandemic and public health preparedness. That's everything you need to know about COVID, but also the testing. I wish they were doing a little bit better job right now, but that's because I'm a big COVID person. And I think that we are missing some opportunities in COVID. At the same time, there is work being done by independent research. So that's good. And then this is interesting. This is one of the top three initiatives right now, mental health and substance abuse use disorder support, expanding mental health care. And Biden just came out with something about this the other day. There is an expansion of mental health care going on. So I'm really happy about that. The Department of Treasury. Now, this is all under Biden. Just I just took the Biden snapshot. So you need to know these are Biden's uh, secretaries, Biden's cabinet members, and Biden's priorities. These will shift once we get a new president. The Department of Tre Treasury is run by Secretary Janet Yellen, and they manage the country's finances, including the Federal Reserve uh, revenue collection, public debt and fiscal policy. And, you know, they only they, they only they use six sixteen billion dollars. I don't know why they need sixteen billion dollars, except here's the things they're working on economic recovery and stimulus efforts. So there they could drop cash in on things to get economic opportunity going like small business, um, stabilizing economy, reducing unemployment, pr promoting growth. Like those are the things where I could see they could drop cash in on some programs. So that's one place to spend. They're addressing global tax reforms. Ugh, that's a big bite. They're trying to figure out a way to prevent ma multinational corporations from avoiding taxes by shifting profits to low tax jurisdictions. And the goal is to create a more equitable international tax system. Hey, that's kind of cool. That would be really good. And then they're tackling climate change through financial policy, because if you can't get the companies to stop being jerks, you can provide incentives for them to do good behavior. Incentives for good behavior are a real thing and they work. So I'm down with that. I'm totally OK with using financial policy to tackle climate change. I think we have to move the levers that we can to get people who are not inclined to behave well to behave well. 
the Department of Transportation is our good buddy, Mayor Pete, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, and he oversees the nation's transportation systems. And I don't know why Biden woke up and said, let's get Mayor Pete on this. But I got to say, that man's amazing. His clarity and his ability to see systems and understand how things work together and to connect dots. He is a truly integrated thinker. And I expect much more from this man as we move forward. He is the kind of brain you want in government because he understands service so well. And now I'm giving a Pete Buttigieg commercial. But the thing is, you got to look at the traits that you want in a cabinet secretary, right? You want someone who's used to providing service. So he was a civil servant and he is service oriented, unlike a, like a Steve Mnuchin who never has helped anybody in his whole life but himself. So these are, you want to start to evaluate even who they put in as cabinet secretaries. I look at like a, an Elaine Chow who worked in Trump's administration, Mitch McConnell's wife. All she did was open up opportunities in China because she got paid by her family who have serious ties in China. I mean, if you go back and look at that, she does not have the character you want in a cabinet member. So Pete, Pete Buttigieg, that's why I got my commercial for Pete Buttigieg, because he has the kind of character you want in a leader. So what are they working on? He's working on inve in infrastructure investment. Oh, we know that's happening. And that is tied to jobs as well. So not only when Biden cut this money loose to improve our infrastructure, which is our bridges and our roads and why you have construction everywhere going on in your town, but that also meant jobs. So that boosted the economy, your local economy, because we're hiring locally. So these are good things. And then he is working on promoting electric vehicles and clean energy. And I have friends who are like, I don't want to ever drive an EV. Well, there's a good chance you will never have to drive an EV if that's not what you want to do. But a bunch of people do want to drive electric vehicles. I actually personally kind of like hybrids because I freak out that I'll run out of electricity and then where am I going to plug in? That seems like a like a perpetual iPhone problem, but with my car. Uh, but a, a hybrid, yeah. And there's also so many other kinds of clean energy. So there we go. He's working on that. And then, of course, road safety and Vision Zero initiative. And I didn't know about this initiative. But it aims to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries on U.S. roadways. They're looking at improving. This is so fundamental, but it's the things we don't think about, right? This is why we have government, because we're never going to think about this. It includes evaluating and improving road design. Something so simple, but could make such a big difference. Just a little more space. Just having that shoulder there for you, knowing how to get off the road in an emergency, simple things like road design could make it safer for us to drive. Uh, improving vehicle safety standards, enforcing traffic laws, promoting safe driving behavior. And I'm going to tell you, dealing with long COVID, because I swear to God, half you drivers out there have long COVID and you don't understand you're not driving as well anymore. Your awareness has decreased. I don't care that your awareness decreased. I don't. I, what I care about is you aren't aware of it yourself. You need to check things with yourself. Anyway, sorry, that's a long COVID message, but Honestly, we're going to see more and more stuff from long COVID. All right. Then we have the Department of Justice, Attorney General Merrick Garland. We all have many opinions on this, but I thought this was interesting. He runs the FBI ATF, which is the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the DEA, which is the Drug Enforcement Agency. And they report to the executive branch. And he has a, a budget of about $40 billion, which seems not like very much. $40 billion seems a little low for... All those agencies, FBI, ATF, DEA, and this is what they're working on, protecting voting rights. So they're out looking at the restrictive voting laws that and practices that are disenfranchising voters. They're combating the death, domestic terrorism and extremism. So they're the ones bringing the cases that, are, that we're finding and looking at how domestic terrorism is increasing. And then they're working on civil rights enforcement, including tackling system, systemic issues like racial discrimination, police misconduct, and hate crimes. That's a lot on that agenda. I, I am almost thinking that we're at a point in our history where we might need to fund the DOJ a little heavier for a while, just for a while till things get back to... I was going to say normal, but I don't think there's back to normal. Maybe back till we get to a place where people actually take personal responsibility for their behavior and want to work collectively. And we get out of this us versus them mentality. Maybe if we could just stop being divided as in America, we could spend a little less on the Department of Justice. Next up is the Department of Energy. 
Jennifer Granholm is in charge and she manages the country's energy supply, including nuclear energy and atomic weapons. So even the weaponry that we use in defense has to run through the energy department to make sure, because energy has different set of criteria, right? It's got to be safe. It's got to be handled properly. It's got to be controlled because if the bad guys get it, we're in a world of hurt and cannot let the bad guys get the energy. So she has a budget of $52 billion. Again, kind of small for the DOE, but here's what they're working on. So I think the budget kind of fits. They're working on the clean energy transition and climate goals. That makes sense, how to align energy with those two things. They're building a domestic clean energy supply chain. Yes, supply chains are everything. If you don't think about this, the way to get a lot of efficiencies, and, and actually where we have a lot of cyber um, vulnerability right now is in supply chain. I know this won't be hard for you to imagine, but the way cyber works is that it's, it's not, you don't just plug into one person's system and it's complete all the way through from point to point. They, you keep changing systems. So in cybersecurity, if, you, if you're secure here and you hop onto a lily pad that's not secure, and you're only on that lily pad for three minutes, but it doesn't matter because you hopped on the lily pad and in that three minutes, in that three seconds, in that one second, the bad guys got your data. The way they got it, just so you know, they didn't just download it because that would take forever. What they did is they put a bug in there and they put a, a path in. They, they, they've they managed to get a way in that they can now use when you go to your other lily pads. So this is really important that they're paying attention and securing our energy. They're going to build, and, and this is and this was around supply chains, right? This is why we got to pay attention to our supply chains. We've got a lot of vulnerabilities. So I love, there, this is not a particular about a vulnerability. It has to do with the clean energy supply chain, but that's just as critical. And the fact is we're building some of these new things. So they're going to build security in which is what we want. We want them to build the security in. And then we have advanced energy research and innovation, which is the like R&D, energy R&D, which we should have R&D in, in a few of these agencies. And I don't know, I didn't go back and check, but it seems like every agent should, every agency should have one area where innovation is just allowed to happen. And it's just an idea hub. They do this in companies. We should do this in government. I know a lot of times that comes from the PACs and the outside committees because we out here know what we need and not necessarily the agencies, but it'd be nice to have a formal way to bring that in to a think to a think tank that's on our side, not paid for by anybody private. It's paid for by Americans collectively so that there's no uh, bias and we can really look at these new ideas. So that's what we have here in the DOE. We have an advanced energy research and innovation. That's pretty cool. We have the Environmental Protection Agency run by Michael S. Regan, and he is responsible for promoting human health and protecting the environment by regulating pollutants and enforcing environmental laws. He has a budget of 12 billion, just 12 billion. Now go back and think of that defense budget of 848 billion and we have 12 in the EPA. And we're just gonna like, I'll do my John Stewart, come see me at camera number three right now because if you haven't been paying attention, talked about it the other day, Boar's Head, the brand Boar's Head, they make deli meats kind of high end. Uh, you've seen it at the grocery store if you are poor enough to have to go to grocery stores. <laughs> Sorry, that cracks me up. I'm like, oh my God, how are all these politicians not going to grocery stores? We have to go to grocery stores. I have to go after this podcast. So Boar's Head was out of a plant, and I believe it's Virginia. I might be wrong on that. Please check that. In When Trump was president, Trump rolled back pig regulations on how to process pigs, manufacturing food, right? something I don't love to think about, but I know it's real. You manifest, I'm, I'm mostly don't eat meat. That's just a meat thing. But you uh, you butcher pigs and he cut the regulations back. Now, I don't know why they weren't reinstated. Maybe just because there were too many trash cans on fire when the Biden administration got there. I mean, let's face it. They couldn't even get in. There was no transition. There was nothing. These poor people had to walk into the most ugliest transfer of power ever, which was really bad for Americans and why I'm super angry at Trump for not even giving a shit about our country doing well during a transition. Nope. All about him. Just all about him. There was no steel. There was no nothing. It was just a big baby having a big baby attack. So at Boar's Head, the plant put out food that had listeria in it. 
and the listeria, I believe, sickened 59 and killed seven. The plant is now going to be closing. If we had regulations, and, I, and maybe we'll have FDA coming up. This is the EPA. But let me just give my speech on regulations. If we have regulations, Boar's Head, number one, would still be open and we'd still have those jobs. So we would still have people being employed. People are losing jobs now. The plant is closing. People are losing jobs. A whole community is going to feel the effects of that plant closing because it's a plant. This isn't a store. It's a plant. The plant is closing and people are losing jobs. So we've lost two assets right there, the economy and the jobs. They're going to get sued by the 59 people who got sick and the seven people who died. So they have lawsuits up the yin-yang. And number four, they've killed their brand. Killed it. They closed the thing. They've killed their brand. Regulations could have prevented all of that. People not getting sick. They could have. The people didn't have to die. But no, Trump knew, knew better, right? Not Trump, though. Let's be clear. It's his cronies. It's the people right behind him who keep using him as their their Manchurian candidate. Let's call it what it is. So what is the EPA worried about for their $12 billion, just 12? Combating climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. If you don't believe in that, you're welcome. We're going to do it for you anyway, because the ice caps are melting and the weather patterns are changing and you need to go read something. We have an environmental justice initiative to, dis uh, to address the disproportionate environmental health impacts faced by low income and minority communities. And you need to understand most of the pollution has been placed near people of color because we are nothing in America, if not horrible. So they're trying to fix those kinds of inequities. And then they're trying to clean something called polyfluoral alkyl blah, blah, PFAS. You know what they are. P they're the forever chemicals. We've heard about these for decades, if you are old like me, and they pose significant health risks. And they're trying to make sure that these are cleaned up from drinking water and more. So this is why we need these agencies. I don't want to think about my drinking water. I still, uh, our drinking water is so good in Santa Cruz. I don't know why people fill up water jugs, except unless they just don't have access to running water, which that's a, that's a reasonable reason. But I like living in a country that has water you can drink. And I know that's not true for the whole country. And that makes me sick. So we need to keep, we've still got work to do and we need to stop with these inequities. The Department of Agriculture is Secretary Tom Vilsack, and he manages agricultural policy. This is more where uh, my food safety issue would have been that I just talked about the Boar's Head, Boar's Head Deli stuff. It manages agricultural policy, food safety, and rural development. And they are working on smart climate, smart agriculture, and forestry. You know forestry. Those are the people that sweep California forests every day. Foresters. I don't even know what that is. They sweep our forests every day. We have the Forest Service. They come out. They have brooms. Remember Trump? They have brooms and they just sweep those floors so we don't have fires. That's all just a bunch of crap. What they're trying to do here is there are crops we can grow that will help our planet and there are crops that can grow that won't. An example, almond trees use a ass load of water, just a ton of water. They're, they're really bad for the environment, almond trees. And now we drink almond milk. So there you go. You, we've got to figure some of this stuff out. And what they the, what these agencies usually do as we discussed earlier, is they provide incentives for making that pivot. So I know in California, they've been talking to almond growers for a long time about trying to transition some of your crops. Even though we all like almonds, they're great, but they aren't great where they're being grown in California deserts. I mean, our central coast is like a desert. So that's what I mean. They're just not great for our environment when we're, when we're low on water. So those are the kind of things they look out for. Food security and nutrition programs so people get to eat especially supplemental nutrition like SNAP, and then rural development and infrastructure investment in areas that get ignored all the time. There you go. That's the right thing. Social Security is an acting commissioner, Kalolo Kajakazi. Great name, all with Ks. And Social Security is working on three things right now. Their budget is $1.2 trillion. And what they are responsible for, or the things they're working on right now, they are responsible for providing benefits to retirees, disabled, and survivors of deceased workers. And even when my dad was murdered, we got, I don't think I did because I was 18. I think both my brothers got uh, SSI, Social Security Income, which was his survivor benefits from Social Security, which happens when you have minor children. So that's a thing. If you make, there's no reason for you to know that unless you've lost 
a parent, a, a parent, a, you know, like your partner and your kids need help, you can get SSI for your kids from your, per, from your person's social security. That's one of the things they do. Their big initiatives right now are improving customer service and modernizing technology. And that praise you. That's all I got to say. Praise. Because one of the hardest things of selling cybersecurity to the U.S. government is our systems are so dated. You might have just gotten the Windows 11 update on your computer. They're not even close to that. It's just, what does somebody say? They're running Windows 95? That's what. That's the big joke. When we have a cybersecurity breakout, it's like, what are they running? Windows 95 still? So yes, modernizing technology should be on the top of every agency's priorities. They're also addressing the Social Security Trust Fund solvency. So this is trying to make sure that the money's always there. And we're going to go through the big, as you know, we probably heard about this. We have the baby boomer giant cohort that's pushing through Social Security right now. They're easily 70 years old. And you really don't want to take your Social Security until you're 70. If you can not touch it till you're 70, that's when you'll get the maximum benefit. But of course, Trump wants to also increase, not Trump, Project 2025, Trump doesn't give a crap. They also want to push retirement age as if that's a thing, because this is a post-industrial world now where knowledge workers, retirement's not really a thing, but they want to push that age to later. Basically, what they're telling you is they don't want to give you your social security until much later. It is a it is a luxury to be able to wait for it till 70 I'm aware. That's why a lot of us save in our 401ks. We use that money until we get to 70. But if if you don't have that money, you might have to take Social Security earlier. But if they move the age back, then you can't. So they're looking for ways to make sure that the Social Security stays solvent. And they also are looking for a way to, to make sure there's equity and Social Security benefits. The deal is that if you don't earn much in your lifetime, you're not going to get much in Social Security. And so it's almost... Um, a fait accompli, right? It's it's like I didn't earn much and now I'm not going to have much in my retirement at, from Social Security because I never was a very high earner. That's going to always be a problem for women. It's going to always be a problem for low-income people. It's going to be a problem who for people who had to go in and out of the workforce for any... I, I was a consultant, so I had to pay uh, more Social Security, but that's that's what they got to figure out. And I think looking for that equity, finding a way to to... One of the big ways will be to tax rich people. That that will make a that will make the whole difference here. We've let them off the hook. And do you know some of those rich people actually take Social Security, which just because they're entitled to it, that's why. It's an entitlement. And that's when they call it an entitlement because they don't need it, but they're entitled to it. For the rest of us, we need it. The Department of Education is Secretary Miguel Cardona. And his mission is to access to quality education and oversee federal student loans and education standards. And this is the one that blew my mind when I saw the budget. If we have 848 billion, so every billion, when I'm saying like 848 billion compared to the number I'm going to tell you, it sounds like it's going to already be huge, but it's going to sound like it's only, you know, eight times bigger, but it's billions guys. So it's ex it's exponentially bigger. Like it's not just a little bit bigger. It's vastly bigger. Right now for education, we are spending 90 billion. That's it. And what the, here's what they're trying to do with that 90. Expand access to quality education for as many people as they can, including early childhood education, which is one of the best investments ever. And then improving access to higher education, especially for low income and minority students, because this is an unusual behavior. It's a new, any first generation folks going to call, oh, sorry, I'll just explain this for a second. I did the most fun thing. I live in Santa Cruz. We have UC Santa Cruz right here. It's it's, it's a big UC right here up on the hill. But the kids at the school Katie went to our, our local middle school. I happen to live in Live Oak, which is an unincorporated area of town. And we have a lot of, it's very blue collar. What I love it, working class. I love it because I'm up as a consultant. I'm usually working from home. I love seeing my neighbors during the day. We're all out doing different things. Everybody works all different times. But at the school then, because it attracts its high Latino uh, population, I went into um, a social studies class. I brought in a bunch of Little Caesars pizza because, you know, that's like $5 a throw, right? Nothing. I brought in a bunch of Little Caesars pizza and did a, a, a workshop for the kids on college. And I told them all about college. And then they we all got to do a field trip later up to UCSC. And even in my town where the college is right here on the hill, so many kids aren't exposed to it. So this idea of expanding access to quality education is as much as just, it's just 
helping people know where to go and how to do it. If you come from a college educated household, parents, whatever, you don't, these things are regular. You're used to them. But if you don't come from that background, we're speaking a different language. So I love the idea of expanding that access and making it accessible. They're also working on student loan debt relief and reform, and then strengthening career and technical education. Not everybody has to go to college, right? My daughter is so telling me that all the time. For her, learning is that kind of learning is just pain. So she'd much rather go get you do technical education or go do get a certificate in something and just be an expert in that thing. I'm not worried. She's smart. She's going to do fine. But college isn't for everybody. So we need to make sure we have other opportunities. The next agency is the Federal Reserve System, which Chairman Jerome Powell, and this regulates the nation's monetary policy and controls inflation and ensures financial stability. But in their budget, it's very cute. Their budget is $7 billion. It's a little Little Federal Reserve doing his thing. <laughs> they print the money. That's, you know, what the heck? They print the money. But they are responsible for managing inflation and monetary policy, like adjusting interest rates, which I'm hoping we're going to get an interest rate adjustment coming up maybe this week. I'm not sure. But I need mortgage rates to go down. So anybody knows anybody, can we just get mortgage rates back down so some of us can afford our homes? Uh, they work on the Federal Reserve work, works on economic recovery and employment. That's great. Those are two people just sitting there keeping an eye on what the hell's going on and who's doing what to whom and how are, are we have balance everywhere? Can people everywhere get jobs? What about 60 year olds like me? Can we get jobs? We'll find out. And then strengthening the financial system. And so we know we saw some banks go down. Silicon Valley Bank had a very bad uh, year. They, their bank went under. We've got some banking. This is going to be, well, here, let's just back up. This is going to be huge when you add crypto. So the Federal Reserve is trying to address risks that in, and enforce regulations designed to prevent risk and promote resilience in the face of an economic shock. shock. That's a lot of words to say. If we take something in the shorts, we need to be able to bounce back easily. Resilience only means that we can just pick up and keep going. It's pretty much a three-year-old when they're running down the street, they fall, they look at you, you don't acknowledge they're in pain. So they brush up their hands, the little palms of their hands and they keep going. That's resilience, right? You fell, you got up and you kept going. That's what we need in our financial system. And we're gonna start to see, it's gonna get ugly. I'm afraid after this election, Trump's not gonna win. And Elon and Peter Thiel are going to lose their damn minds and crypto is going to go nuts. They're going to try to use crypto to get around all of our stable financial systems. So watch that. And I highly advise you to stay out of it. I don't, this is not sorted. It is not figured out. There are no rules of engagement and the people playing are ruthless. That's the, the those are all the reasons I say I would avoid it right now. Your money is not protected. If you lose it, it's gone. And like I said, the rules are not defined. There's no regulations. And the people playing in this crypto market are not good people. It's all nefarious. So there you go. That's your Jen Carroll TED Talk. Agency number 13 is the Department of Commerce. We're almost done. Secretary Gina Raimondo is responsible for promoting economic growth to the Department of Commerce supporting businesses and gathering critical financial data that helps us understand how things work. This is a weird department, Department of Commerce, because guess what gets folded into the Department of Commerce? NOAA, the North, uh, North. Uh, they're going to have the answer. What is it? N-O, I forget what the O part stands for. Then something, ocean, and I'll have it. I have it in writing in a few. So I'll give it to you in writing. But isn't it weird? NOAA is in, in, the sense, in the census. This is Department of Commerce. So they're worried about our businesses and how they're doing. They manage the Census Bureau because the census is really important. It tells us how many representatives you get for a based area based on the number of people that you have. It also tells you, it also tells the government where they need to spend money and who they need to spend it on and place, you know, place your bets on the line. Where are the people, where are the places that need investment and where are the places doing okay? And maybe they just need some new ideas or some a program that's to, to you know whatever that is that's what they're figuring out in the department of commerce kind of where to place their bets and how to make things work their 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 focus this is really cool is on advancing u.s competitiveness and innovation 
So the first thing they're working on is domestic semiconductor manufacturing and reducing reliance on foreign supply chains. Now, that's a different thing from being an isolationist. Every time we rely on foreign supply chains, it increased the cost, especially if you belong to Trump economics, where he wants to put a tariff on everything that's imported. And every tariff adds to the price that we pay. It doesn't add to the price that they pay. A tariff was originally designed to make you avoid paying for something. That was the purpose. If it had a tariff on it, it's because we didn't want you to buy it. The government did not want you to buy that thing. So they're making it harder on you. Kind of what they wanted to do to soda. Put a, put a, um, they had a name for the kind of tax it was. Like, it's just your, it, they called it like a, a, I forget the tax, but it's, it's based on your habits. So there, there's an example of where a tax is supposed to try to change your behavior. That's a negative consequence. It's very different from an incentive. But that is what's happening with the Department of Commerce is they're looking at ways to advance our competitive and innovation. And that's key. And the supply chain, our reliance on foreign supply chain, especially for some of these things, is really, really puts us in a tenuous, dangerous position. I especially want to know in the, in the area of defense how much we're importing, because that really does make us vulnerable. They are, the Department of Commerce, but I get it, it's about commerce, is expanding broadband access so that people can get on the internet. There's still some communities that don't have good access to the internet. And, and remember, your ability to play on the internet has everything to do with whether you can afford it or not. I saw the video of the little girl at Taco Bell who was doing her homework outside because she was using their Wi-Fi network. And the, the restaurant, thank God, noticed and brought her in. They came out and said, you can't do that. And they brought her inside because they're like, no, you can do it in here where there's a table and a chair. That shouldn't be what anybody has to do to get Wi-Fi. It just shouldn't be that hard and it shouldn't be that expensive. So that's what they're working on, expanding that access. And then, of course, climate sustainability efforts. And if you roll your eyes, I'm going to smack the back of your head. Just smacked you. Do not roll your eyes about climate and sustainability. Pretty soon, climate's going to prevent our food supply from working the way it needs to work. And then this is going to get serious because when people are hungry, they turn into animals. So we need to be anticipating the changes that are coming. And even the Department of Commerce is on it. Next to last is the Department of Foreign Affairs, Secretary Dennis McDonough, and I. it's M-C-D-O-N-O-U-G-H. So that's Scott, right? McDonough, McDonough. Get my Scott, get my Scott going. It's McDonough. Uh, the mission, that's the Secretary Dennis McDonough, provides healthcare benefits and services to veterans. I think we all know that, and their families. Their budget, though, is, is interesting to me. It's $325 billion. Compare that to our defense budget of $848 billion. We are spending a lot on our vets. I don't know if we're getting our money's worth. I, I really, now Trump's answer here is to privatize it. I know that's not the answer. Dudes, I know what happened when we let insurance companies get in the way of medicine. They started telling people they couldn't have procedures. I know the answer isn't to let the private sector have this because they will strip out the humanity and only focus on the things that make profit. That's not what our vets need. They don't need that at all. But I'm wondering how we're spending this 30, 325 billion if it's really getting into the hands of the people that need it. Because I think there's a lot of folks out there who really want to help, help our veterans. It is, as I mentioned, we learned a valuable lesson after Vietnam is you don't crap on the soldiers who fought for you. You take care of them. And I still feel like we've got a problem here. We have a huge suicide rate. We've got some things we've got to do. So the first thing they're trying to do in the in the VA is expand access to health care for veterans. So that's great. The second thing they're trying to do is suicide prevention and mental health support. Spot on. That is the right place to go. And if you didn't read my article about EMDR, I put it out there on Twitter. Um, I have it in my blogs because that's back from murder days. But mental health support's key. And then they're looking at veterans benefits and claims modernization. And there's where you want to see it. I suspect we still spend a lot on being out of date. So if we can get modernization done, and I hope they hired some Silicon Valley hot jobs to come in and help them. But as soon as we can get modernization done, I suspect our $325 billion will start to be invested with more results and less on infrastructure. And then our last agency is the Federal Communications Commission. I just talked about them and the Fairness Doctrine. Jessica Rosenworcel, Rosenworcel, does that sound like something you would eat? Like that's a kind of cheese, right? Rosenworcel, German, I don't know. I don't know what that name is, but it's cool. Rosenworcel, 
she is responsible over at the FCC for regulating interstate and international comms communications by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable. And her budget is 410 million, not billions, 410 million. That's not very much. Although it sounds like most of the stuff they do in the FCC is really around policy and not about implementation. They're working on expanding broadband access. So they're trying to make sure that access is actually accessible to low-income households versus up above where they were working on the broadband access, which was coming out of the Department of Commerce. It's just making sure that it's everywhere in the country. The FCC is trying to make sure you can afford it if it's where you live. Next, they're working on network resiliency and emergency comms. That's a big deal. So that's great. Coming out of the FCC, they've got to make sure that like when you get a, an Amber Alert, that's coming out across, that goes across carriers. You've got to be able to go across carriers. I used to work in telco. I know getting across, especially on the mobile side, I was on the mobile side mostly, but working cross carrier is, a, is hard. Remember, we couldn't even get Betamax and VHS figured out, guys. I still have 75 different kinds of USB cords in my office right now. So we have got to, doing something like making sure we have standards that work across all technologies. So something like emergency communications work. It sounds so simple, but innovation often doesn't take pragmatic concerns into account. So I'm glad they're working on that. And then there are, they focus on 5G deployment and spectrum management. And we talked yesterday about the air or the other day about fairness doctrine and the airwaves and they're across bands. So airwaves operate at different bands megahertz, I think they are, uh, you know, just enough to be dangerous. They What we need to do is manage that spectrum. So people license that to be able to use those spectrums. So you pay, to the, you pay for the license, you have to earn the license, you have to maintain the license in an honorable way, you have to have good behavior, you have to be audited, all that stuff's going on and being run by the FCC. I think we're in good shape. So those, okay, so those are the agencies. And I, I was going to go on to the quiz, but I'm going to keep the quiz aside for a uh, tomorrow because I think this is a lot and I feel like I've been talking a lot but I wanted to get these agencies in your brain because we cannot take them for granted we have fundamental things we need to do as a country to serve all Americans and that's what these agencies do and it does not behoove us to think of them as being comparable to business that is that's not going to be a winner for us because you sometimes need to make decisions that are not profitable. You need to make decisions that are in the best interest of man, not in the best interest of entity. And we and that's why the government and that's why democracy and the government and authoritarianism are so freaking um, at odds because democracy really is by the people for the people. And that's where we want to be. Thank you for listening today. I'll be back tomorrow. We're going to have the cool um, content on what these agencies are doing for you that you may not know about. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Make sure you subscribe and rate, and I'll be back with another episode really soon.